There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast, and I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio from my house with my lovely wife, Monica, also known as Momica. Rainbow, <laughs> God is Momica. Rainbow Unicorn, as some people affectionately know her. Monica, what's going on? How are you? Hola. Hello. I'm wonderful, baby. How are you? I'm good. You're finally on the podcast. I've had a bunch of people, mostly middle-aged women, me- re- messaging me saying, why is your wife not on the podcast? You interview all those people and you never interview your wife. We all want to hear from your wife. So I was like, you know what? She's got a good Monica love. She's got a good point. So Monica is now on the podcast today. So for you guys that don't know my wife, which I'm sure many of you do not know my wife, my wife's bio is she's a best-selling author. Her book is called Cracking the Fountain of Youth Code. It's on Amazon. She's also a real estate, uh, residential real estate agent from Southern California who's very successful and sold more than 400 million in residential reality, real estate in her life. Uh, at one time I worked with Monica, we were a team. Um, and now she's just an amazing mom that has raised three biological children and my two biological children. Um, and now she is um, living the dream, right, babe? Living the dream. Jay Campbell's wife. That's right. She just tells people when we go out in public, she's like, do you know who my husband is? No, I'm just kidding. She <laughs> I had, to, I, had to, I had to say that on this podcast, but no, um, your life is your life is very interesting life. So I think if we just get into like what happened and, you know, we don't talk for three hours, we talk 40, 40 to 45 minutes and make it high level. Um, I think people will find a lot of value in it. So why don't you just talk a little bit about your childhood and kind of set, set up the story. Okay. Uh, so for those that don't know me, I am the third of four. My parents uh, met in LA. My mom was an immigrant from Mexico and dreamed of marrying a, an American white man with blue eyes because she wanted to have a child with blue eyes and not one of us had blue eyes, by the way. So they got married in April of 69, had my sister January of 70, had my brother December of 70, had me November of 71, had my brother June of 73, and my dad left three weeks later. Uh, my mom found out later when they got married that my dad was a severe alcoholic, had drug problems, and my dad um, just decided to leave when we were all little. So we grew up on welfare. Um, we all we were really, really close. Like that was the one thing that I thought was so cool about us is that my siblings and I had a really good relationship growing up. We were always there for one another. We had each other's back. Um, my mom was very much of a she just made her presence known and it was we were scared to do anything outside of what she indicated was right and she was a devout catholic so we would always go to catholic church and were required to sit there and listen to the priest even though we didn't want to be there so that you know and my dad would come back off and on um you know he had his alcoholic moments where he would just i guess you could say be physically abusive, mentally abusive. And so each, each of my siblings and I dealt with that in different ways growing up. Uh, for me personally, because I can only speak for myself, I struggled for many, many years with confidence. I didn't have any self-confidence. I didn't like who I was. I felt like I wasn't wanted. I felt like I wasn't part of my family. I felt like I was always an outsider. I was very much a loner. I always, I always wanted like a best friend and oh my God, I yearned for that all the time. I just thought, God, I'd love to have a best friend and never could ever have like my own best friend. And, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I was smart until I found partying in high school. And then 
I realized that all of a sudden I had liquid courage and I could have some confidence when I was drinking. And my girlfriends and I in high school were the party girls and made a name for ourselves with just getting drunk on the weekends and having a good time. Then I met my first husband, uh, Carlos, when I was working in the mall at the Gap. And I was just beside myself because when I was younger, I used to just pray. And I, I guess you could say teenage years, I would just pray that somebody would like me with all of my flaws. I just wanted somebody to love me because I'd never understood what love was. I just felt like it was this like an unattainable thing for me. And so when this good looking guy paid attention to me, I was like, oh my God, this is like, wow. So I attempted to be the perfect girlfriend. And then when we got married almost five years later, I met him when I was 17, got married when I was 22. Um, and he was the last of 14 kids, babied by his mom and his seven sisters. And I basically took on the role of being the perfect wife and doing everything I could to make sure that he was happy while I was miserable. <laughs> and I attempted to be the perfect mom as well. And, and I was one of those moms that wanted to make sure that my kids knew they were loved because I didn't feel that love when I was growing up. And so I overcompensated in a lot of ways. And, and then when I went into real estate and well, I first I started with my dad, I was in real estate appraising, did that for, I want to say 17 years. And I, I did decently okay, but I was never really like in it. And then when I started doing sales, I was like, wow, this is so awesome. I'm learning how to talk to people. I can create, I mean, once I started getting the groove, I was getting so good at presenting with people that it was just flawless. And I enjoyed meeting with people. I was creating miracles with clients. It was just, it was an amazing journey because I learned a lot about my own power in real estate. Um, not to say that I didn't screw up because at the beginning when I was with Carlos, I did screw up. I was attempting to figure out who I was when I was drinking and then I went to a seminar, I ended up cheating on him. This is when we were having problems initially and I, and I wanted, I wasn't sure how to address them. Like I, I knew that we weren't meant to be together because I actually started questioning that soon after we got married. But once we started having kids, I was like, okay, I got to make this work. I got to make this work. I got to make this work. And we had three kids, Evan, Ezra, and Alana. And I just, I made a lot of mistakes and I wanted out and he wouldn't let me out. And it was really hard because I didn't know. And you and I always talk about this because uh, you always say, because I was with him for 21 years and you always go 21 years. <laughs> Um, I was doing everything I could to make sure that I did everything I could because in my mind, I thought if my kids ever asked me, mom, did you, did you do everything you could to, to make the relationship work between dad and you? I wanted to be able to say, yes, I did. And I honestly, at that point, I do know that I did everything I could. And it's just sometimes I realize that when something just isn't working, you just can't force it. You just can't. So, 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 so you just pretty much gave us a life story, um, up until you met me, which was in 2012. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can okay. tell that story too. Without, well, without giving our backstory, because I think it's been told, you can give a summary, but, um, so I met you on match.com in 2012 of August and we were both coming out of our divorce. You still were not technically divorced, even though you were living separate from your husband, uh, Carlos ex-husband now. Um, both of us had baggage, you know, I had two little girls that were obviously with my ex who was in Florida. And then you had your kids every other weekend. Well, actually Evan chose to live with you, your oldest son. He chose to live with you permanently, but you were sw swapping the, the other kids, Ezra and, and Alana. And then I came into the picture and you started dating me and Ezra, your middle son, your second oldest became estranged because Carlos was lying to him or them about our relationship. And you were also not telling them the truth initially either. Cause you didn't have to tell them that I was your boyfriend. You told them that I was your trainer. So there's a lot of like weird stuff going on, but obviously it was difficult because you and I were attempting to back to, 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 to make a relationship with baggage, right? We had kids from other uh, spouses. Um, I was freshly divorced and obviously broken 
because of what had happened to me being arrested, you know, falsely accused of all these different things. The girls being kidnapped technically from me, taken to Florida, you know, without my permission. Um, and then I'm now coming from where I was living at that time in Las Vegas back to LA where I'd been, you know, living 18 years previously, uh, after two years in Las Vegas. And I started working uh, again at Keith Lexus, working for Ryan Galante, shout out to Ryan and you and I then met on match.com. And I think initially what we were, what, what, what really truly connected to us was fitness, right? Because you saw that I was fit. And you were doing this like bucket list thing where you were doing a fitness competition for women. Yeah. Um, and you sent me an email on match.com and you were like, oh, you know, I'm competing too. And like, maybe you could show me some tips or, you know, whatever, a small talk conversation. And so obviously the famous story, which I won't get into of us meeting at Conrad's in Pasadena. And but I want to say something about that first though, because <clears throat> what I think, what I think is important to understand, especially for people that are in relationships that are, you know, breaking off and they're getting back and venturing out into the dating world is I truly understood that I had a part in the, the dissolving of the relationship between Carlos and I. And I knew that if I did not heal those issues in me and truly decide to be different, I was going to continue to attract the same kind of men if that's what I desired to do as, as far as dating was concerned. So I, after dating, because Carlos and I were separated for like two and a half years before you and I um, met because I got to a point where I was just like, forget it. He's not agreeing to anything. He wouldn't sign anything. He would just keep saying, yeah, 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 and push it off, push it off. Because um, in his mind, he thought that I would change. My, he thought I was going through a phase. And so when I when I got to the point where I was truly who I knew I am, I decided to stop drinking alcohol because I knew for me that was one of the negative side effects of, of the, the lack of confidence, of, of losing. There were times when I was drinking and the next day I would wake up and I'd be like, that's not me. Like, that is not me. And I don't like not being me what is wrong with you? And I would have these, like, I would beat myself up time and time again. And so I knew that that was part of it. I had to stop drinking. I had to decide that I was willing to show up as a person I knew I came here to be. And that's what I did. So February of 2012, I made the commitment to myself to get into better shape physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And that involved no drinking. That involved, I didn't date at all after that for, it was six months. Because every, yeah, because it was six months before I decided to get back into it. And I delved deep. I delved deep into who I am. I truly desired to enjoy life and connect with me and understand who I am and what, what power I have as a human being. Geez, that was, I was 40 before I finally decided to be who I came here to be. And when I really truly came into that, I was freaking in love with myself. Yeah. But not from an egotistical or arrogant way, but from a like, damn, it's so much fun to be me. This is so cool. I actually like the person that I am now. Well, well to that, years. but to that point, to that point, when I met you in Conrad's, I was impressed because I, you know, was broken, as you know. And, you know, at that point in time in my life, I think you know that my, my goal with women was having sex with three women in one day and, you know, achieving orgasm. And I never was able to do it, of course, just for anybody that asked me, but like I was broken. And I, when I oh, met you, when I met you after I, you know, gave you my bullshit story of, you know, my victimhood, you know, here, here's, here's who I am, blah, 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 expecting you to get up and walk away. Cause that's what my, that's what really the purpose of my conversation with 30 minutes diatribe was. You were like, oh, okay, well, my story is not, not as, you know, not as crazy, but like, here's my story. And then after you got done speaking for 10 minutes or whatever, not even that long, probably I was like, wait a minute, you're genuinely happy. And you're like, yeah, isn't it everyone. And I was like, no, I didn't think it isn't everyone. I was just like, well, yeah. No, but, but I said, I, you, no, you did. You said, you said, yeah, but isn't everybody like, or something like all those lines that I was like, no. And so like, I was genuinely intrigued, but it was your, it was your, it, it, it was your, your, um, 
you had mastery of your of your higher self. You 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 or I shouldn't say mastery. You had connected. You were you had connection with your higher self. You were very spiritually balanced. You were emotionally balanced, and I was very much drawn to that. Even though I was very anti woman, mm -hmm. anti relationship, broken. I was a broken soul at that point in my life. Um, yeah. But I was I was drawn to that. And so I think that's really what built our relationship. And obviously over the next four months through the trials and tribulations of me breaking up with you a hundred times because I was so broken. I mean, I want the audience to know that like I was in a very bad place, but I was also coming from a mindset of a very accomplished, successful breadwinner man who's now like broken to the point of like, I had nothing to my name. I wasn't bankrupt, but I was as close as you could be financially bankrupt. And I didn't feel confident about who I was as a provider anymore. My kids have been stolen from me. I was still, at the time I met Monica, the felony charges have been dropped. But as you remember, I was still under, um, not felony, but what do you call it? Um, what are the other kind of charges when you're not, they're not felony, they're misdemeanor, misdemeanor charges. But they were, they were still an open record. And my attorney was constantly telling me that I couldn't get in trouble. I couldn't get a, a ticket. You know, anything can be reopened and they could use it against me because I'll call it the justice system works. That's a whole podcast, by the way. But. Um, you know, for four months we dated and we went back to Florida, which I hadn't seen my kids in almost what a year. Um, and you know, you were able to talk to my ex, uh, to get her to say, yeah, sure. I'll let you, because you're going to be with them. I'll let you see them. And so, you know, we saw the girls in October after we went to the Mike Ferry seminar in Miami, we drove up to Tampa, we saw them and Gabby didn't know who I was. And I was utterly devastated. And it was surreal. And then I came back, you know, I was still working at Keys Lexus and, um, dude, what happened within three weeks? Remember that whole, there was that big HR debacle at the dealership. And we went to well, Starbucks to plan out our future. Was, well, remember there was a girl, I mean, I, I want to tell, I want people to hear the story. There was a girl literally at the dealership that was literally videotaping management at the dealership and what they said. And, and Jay she, has no filter. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, you guys know, I don't, I speak authentically and transparently, but I don't like hold punches. And this is, you know, let's just put it this way. Nobody can hire me in today's bullshit, you know, uh, PC world. But I didn't say anything mean or, or unbecoming. I just said the truth. And you couldn't say the truth. This was at the beginning of the PC world takeover of Southern California uh, and all of California. And so anyway, she videotaped all these managers at the dealership speaking. And I remember coming into work one day and it was like my manager, who's still a very close personal friend of mine, who was you know, part owner of the dealership, called me into his office and told me what happened. He's like, look, man, you're the last guy here. You know, from a hiring standpoint, we got to make a sacrifice. You know, we got to give this girl a pound of flesh. So anyway, they let me go. I remember going out to my car, calling Monica. Now, obviously, this is my fourth job loss in a year's time, right? And well, actually two years time, two years time. And, um, you know, after being the executive with Kelly Blue Book for 10 years and like me and the bee's knees and all this stuff. So like, obviously I'm at rock bottom at this point. And I just remember calling to you and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't get a job in, in my chosen field because of my background. You know, there's still a criminal, uh, arrest there. And while I will pass a background check, that'll show up. And she's like, just work with me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, but she was like, everything you do is exactly what I need, you know? And, and, but I was a wage slave mind, mindset and mentality. And so I wasn't, you know, able to pick up and just be like, what are you talking about? You know, but we did. And literally Monica and I went to a Starbucks and we planned out on a napkin. We literally on a napkin planned out our future. And we'll, we'll tell you guys, you know, we'll summarize them briefly a little bit through the rest of this podcast, but the next 10 years were pretty insane. Yeah. Like, and, and I want to, I also want to just let people know too, like, especially from perspective, because I've had women ask me uh, as far as like attracting you into my life. It was not all roses and sunshines no. and birds singing because at the beginning, like most people would have literally, like Jay said, run because Jay was very, very angry and very demonstrative about his anger at the beginning. <laughs> and many people would have said, I'm done. The, the good thing for me and in, in my, to see what, what I learned in, in my journey at that time of investing into me is when I'm curious about life, when I'm curious about results and I'm not attached to outcomes, 
miracles can happen. And when you and I got together and we hugged, well, first you kissed me as I was going into that dressing room. And then I was like, whoa, whoa he's a pretty good kisser. And then we started walking around and um, the moment that he embraced me and I felt to the heart to heart connection, like it wasn't just a like juices flowing kind of thing. It was a heart to heart connection. That's when I knew that the man in front of me was scared of his own power. And because he was scared of his own power, he had a lot of anger. And I saw beyond all of that. And so when he would get angry and he would overreact, whatever it was, you know, because he was the first man that I ever held in my arms that was sobbing, literally sobbing because he missed his girls. Like I remember holding him and he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to protect them? What happens if something happens to them? And I was just letting him cry and just showing him genuine, authentic love because ultimately I, I had so much intuitive knowing about the connection between Jay and I more so than he did at the beginning. And even when he would be like, you know, I don't know what we're to even together, you know, you're this, da, da, da. he'd tell me all these different things. And I said, okay, that's fine. We, we don't have to be together. And I said, it's okay. You know, I don't, I, I don't need to have you in my life and you don't need to have me. That's fine. I'll leave. And as I was like, no, wait, 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 uh, let's talk about this. And like, he honestly did not understand how to process all these different thoughts going on in his head. And Jay learned over the years how, how to uncover his own power because he had hidden it for so And I wouldn't say necessarily he, he forgot about it for so long. He had been a wage slave for so long. He only knew how to do what he was instructed to do at a very high level, more so than other people, people because Jay has, he's got one of the highest energy of, energies and focus of anybody that I know. Plus he can retain information like an encyclopedia. And so as he began to understand and actually learn how to be calm, a lot of things came together for us. And, and, and I, I think I taught you more about understanding the possibility or actually understanding miracles, how miracles can happen. Because you, you he, he, we were talking about this today, he, at, at the beginning of our relationship, he's like, you're nothing more than a fucking woo-woo chick. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. I like being a woo-woo chick. And we, as we started to go through our relationship, there was so much evidence of a miracle. This would be a miracle and that would be a miracle. So it was like a recognition of, hey, did you realize this is a miracle? Did you realize this is a miracle? And as he started to get more evidence of these miracles, he was like, wow, we're fucking kick ass together. And we really are. We really have this dynamic, I could say light around us because when him and when Jay and I are working in synergy with one another, there's nothing that cannot be accomplished because where he is strong and I am weak and vice versa, it's like we complete this whole dynamic, beautiful light that just shines outward. And to me, that's exciting because I was in a relationship before that was so depleting. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I, anybody who knows me and for you guys who don't know this, like Monica is my best and greatest spiritual mentor. She's walked me off of many ledges uh, in our relationship. Many mornings when I wake, lay in bed and feel depressed or mm -hmm. you know, existential for whatever reasons, you know, and, and, and people like me who are extreme creators, you know, produce prodigious amounts of content, you know, are creating all the time. I mean, people like us, and there's many people that watch this podcast that are like this and not special by any stretch, but like, we definitely have dark moments, right? Because when you create at this level, as I always say, what goes up must come down, right? So it's like, there's times I'm in a dark place and I question like what I'm doing. I question like, you know, recently I'm a bad father. I don't connect with my daughters. Thank God I have you to help that. But like, there's, you know, there's always things that we do when we, when we really truly create at a very high level, where we, where we start to question ourselves, we start to get into self doubt. We have dark moments. And, and Monica has always been there to talk me through things. And there's been some very dark times and, and she knows, but like, you know, I tell people this all the time that I did five MEO, the desert Sonoran code, the synthetic version in a circle in West Hollywood, California in 2012. And I met Monica five months later. And since I did that, 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 that ceremony 
And I didn't know anything about plant medicine slash entheogens, the toad at that point in time. But obviously that, that ceremony changed my life. And I met Monica five minutes late, five months later. And even though she was, she's right, you know, it was not always perfect in rose, rose gardens. There were, there were obviously in all relationships, there were struggles. I mean, it's still been mostly a climb of like this. And it's like she said, like, we both are high energy people and we always like had a goal of constant and never ending improvement. Mm -hmm. And no matter what would get in our way, we would find an option or, or I would just say we would find it. Yeah. We would find an angle. We would find a solution. We would work through it. Uh, and, 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 you know, again, for you guys listening, what we did was pretty impossible. I mean, we were paying a lot of money. Let's just put it that way. I won't say the number, but a lot of money in alimony and child support. Let's just say more than 6000 a month. No, it was a lot more than that. I'm saying it was more than 6000 a month. Yeah, you're being nice. But the reality was, and that was before her and I scratched a single check for our life. You know what I mean? And so we did that for five years between our exes and dealing with all the stuff that we had to deal with. And there were a lot of crazy moments. You know, there were times where Monica wanted to walk, you know, and, and go away and cry and not come home. You know, uh, that's just when you're being meanie. The only, no, no, this was when the car, I'm talking about the Carlos Court situation. Oh, I never walked away from you with that one. Yeah. But, you, you, oh, no, no, no. That was just when I left the courthouse. I truly, I yeah, honestly, but I'm just saying right. there were moments, there were moments in our relationship in the first 10 years that were very difficult for both of us. Yeah. And not easy. It was not easy for either of us to get through. It was not easy for our children to deal with it. It was not easy for, our children to deal with our recalcitrant spouses. I mean, it was, it was not easy. And, and I think most people can relate to this nowadays. Blended families are very difficult things to do. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, the thing to realize too, though, is it's like it, you and I have this thing that we're attempting to create. And then each of those children in that blended family have their own experience of how they're dealing with the whole relationship and the breakdown of the relationship between their parents. So it's like, not only do we have you and I attempting to make something work, but we have each of these children that are having their own experience, whether they hate it, they love it, they're fighting against it, they're, they're helping us. You know, we had, we had some really amazing times and we had some like, this is so Well, like there's one thing that I want to talk about real quick and then we'll get into a couple of your bullet points, you know, because I want to make this about solutions for women because there's so many women that reach out to me nowadays and are like, why aren't you talking to your wife? Why don't you bring your wife on? Let's get your wife stuff. Cause I want to hear how your wife does all this. But like one of the things that happened to me, you know, after I was accused of all these things that I didn't do was that my attorney in Las Vegas, God rest his soul, shout outs to Jack Buchanan. When we actually go back for, final, for the final four or uh, March Madness this year, we, I should reach out to Jack and say, like, you yeah. and we I go to dinner with him because he's such a cool guy. But anyway, he was very demonstrative in telling me that I could not get into a relationship with a woman who had children with a bad husband or an ex-husband because you would always be at risk because you were charged with domestic violence, kidnapping, all these made up charges, but they would always be there. And because they would be a stain on my record and, and granted all these things were, they were all dropped and, and my record was suppressed. But back at that time, he imparted this wisdom, which was very good wisdom at the time, because anybody who's been you know, put through the rigors of the family court system realizes it's a scam that's really designed to harm men and remove men from you know, the, the, the family unit, the nuclear family. I mean, that's a whole nother you know, shadow man story. But the reality is he, 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 he cemented that idea in my mind. And so when I got into this relationship with Monica, I was very reluctant to build a relationship with her daughter. And the reason that I was reluctant, which I ended up telling her daughter more than I ended up telling Monica, because Monica never really listened to me because she didn't understand it in the way that I, you know, understood it. And men understand this. Women don't because you're not going through this. And sometimes it is the other way around. If the man is weak and the woman is the man, you know, in the relationship, it's the same way, but this is the way the family court system did this. So the first month year, was it the first year? Yeah, it was the first year that me and Monica were together when we finally moved into the house in West Covina. Uh, and Alana was crying and Carlos drove up into the driveway and he started screaming at you. And I went out there and I said, Carlos, shut your fucking mouth or I'm going to kill you. Like, you get out of here or I'm going to fucking kill you. 
whatever it was, it was something like that. Now, if you guys know me, you guys know I'm like Monica said, I'm a demonstrative person. I'll make threats, but I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to walk up and even start physical violence with you. Now, if you want to fight, fight with me, I'm going to fight. You throw a punch, I'm probably going to go after you, right? But like this guy, her ex-husband, and you know, he's a nice guy in my opinion now. Like he's got his issues. My ex has her issues, but like he's not I didn't know him. He's yelling at my wife. We weren't married at the time yet. We were boyfriend and girlfriend, but we, we got married soon after. And it's in the presence of her daughter who's screaming and crying, who is always upset whenever the transfer was happening every other week, right? And I'm just taking up for her. But then after that happened, he was such a social justice warrior, he went after me for a year. He did. And he got the police involved. He got the courts involved. And of course, all of them found no fault with me. And I did nothing that I was just a man in his yard threatening someone to get out of his yard saying strong words, but obviously with no intent to do any of those things. So again, my lesson was not to use those type of words, but the bottom line was because of that happening to me and all the bullshit that I dealt with and knowing that I still had my charges open to West Covina and all that, I never made any effort to build a strong relationship with Lana, her daughter, because I just felt like I couldn't. The risk was too great. Carlos could easily, if I ever put my hands on her, touched her, hugged her, did anything, he could use it against me. So it wasn't until she was a senior in high school, which is sadly like seven years later, Six years later, six years later, I think. Is it that? Then I, you know, I was actually able to sit down with Alana. Was that, it was at Jerry's house. I remember that, but what was it for? I don't remember. But anyway, I sat down with her and I told her all this and her and I, you know, had a really firm connection and she understood. And, you know, I was very open and heartfelt with her. And, you know, since that day, we had a really, we've had a really good relationship. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be her bonus father. I'm proud of who she is as a person. She's an amazing soccer player. National champion. Yeah, she's a national champion at Point Loma. The Sea Lions, shout out to the Sea Lions. She's coming back next year to defend their national championship. They probably are going to repeat. But anyway, that was like the hardest part of my relationship with Monica and, and, and bringing these families. Because Monica gave everything to my two daughters. You know, she spent... A lot of her energy, probably, you know, from other people that have told us, probably hurt some of the relationships she had with her own kids because she put so much energy into raising my two daughters. And so it just kind of felt like it was not the same. And, and, and Monica will tell you that I was in building what I was building to get to where I became. She gave me a lot of rope to build. And so when I was building and creating and doing all the things that I was doing to get to where we are now, she was with the girls. She was with Alana and Gabby and Alex, our two daughters, my bonus, my bios and her you know, bonus daughters. And so there was a lot that she gave of herself as a mom and also as a very, very successful residential real estate salesperson uh, who ran a team in Southern California and still does. And we can talk about that. But anyway, I'm just, I'm really grateful that she was able to do a lot of stuff that I probably neglected because again, I was building. It's not an excuse, but I was, she was allowing me to build. And obviously since all the things I built give us a much better life today, but I'm just really grateful that a, I was able to establish the relationship with Alana, even though it didn't probably go over in the way that both of us wanted. And then B that everything ended up being to where it is now today. We're now here we are back in Florida and now we've got the same problem. If we want to call it a problem, we don't have to define it as a problem, but we have the same issues with the girls, you know, they're 14 and 16 and they're not easy to manage at 14 and 16 as, you know, young teenagers, especially with screens and all the stuff that goes on and stuff today with social media and all the other nonsense, but it's just, it's kind of an interesting part of things. Okay. So that's our story. Now, I think some of the stuff that you guys would like to know about too, and during that time is that Monica and I competed in physique and, and uh, bikini and figure shows for a period of two years. And we won like, I think three shows, right? Like we competed in four shows together. We won three, correct? You know more than I do. So it, anyway, while we were doing this, we built up a little bit of a little social media cult followings and people started to look at us and become aware of us because of our physiques. You know, we, were, we, we had a website called Fab Fit Over 40, Fabulously Fit Over 40. And it became like, because I was, had smart people and friends that taught me how to write for the search engines, our, our website became like the number one site online for fitness information over 40, right? Again, we were gaming the search engines, but our physiques, we became very well known for our physiques for our age. And so people were always kind of fascinated 
that we were these like, you know, successful residential real estate in Southern California and also able to be these quote unquote fitness dynamos and keep yeah. up with younger people and, you know, look the way we did and train the way we did. And so, so all of that was going on. And that obviously allowed us, you know, fast forward to now, 10 years later, technically eight to nine to 10 years later to still maintain these bodies and these physiques because we learned how to do it. And so obviously a lot of you guys who watch this are aware of that. And, and I think kind of your biggest questions are like, how can we do that ourselves? Like, you know, what can Monica share, you know, along those lines of like helping other women who are, you know, essentially middle-aged now, right? Because middle age is in your forties and fifties uh, and, and, and attempting to age gracefully. You know, one of Monica's shows and in, in my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health is called Goddess Frequency. And that's what she talks about is like becoming a goddess, becoming a woman who's okay with the fact that she's not 30 anymore and is, you know, a, a sage, you know, you're becoming this, you know, woman in your fifties and sixties now where like you have reached a new, you know, uh, level. And it's like, how do I respect myself and love myself as an aging woman? And I think a lot of women see her as a very powerful call it beacon, you know, for femininity, for middle-aged women. And so I think like, you know, if I can give you a platform here for the rest of this podcast, I think it's more about just telling people or not telling them, but, you know, speaking to them in a way that like lets them know that they can do the same thing. Yeah. See, babe, I am feminine. I am, I'm more feminine than masculine. No one ever said you like, are. He likes to make fun of me sometimes and says that I'm too masculine. Uh, Those but- are her hands. The yeah. mom always used to make fun of her hands. She's like, oh, Monica. Yeah. Such man hands. No, she didn't say man hands. She just said, I, you have my hands. They're so ugly. <laughs> uh, really what I think for me, in my journey, I've realized that, one, it's important to know who you are, know what is possible, because too many women doubt, first of all, their power, and secondly, the possibility of who they can become. Because you hear things like, okay, so, but I can't do that. Like, I just don't enjoy lifting weights or I don't want to do this. And you got to get over all that stuff because you got to look at yourself and be like, okay, what is it that I see for myself? Yeah, tomorrow. Okay. So first of all, tomorrow's not promised, but you got to live as if it is because there's like, you're not going to live like you're going to die tomorrow and eat all these different types of food and then be a blob because one, you're going to have no energy and you're going to just feel and look miserable. So for me, it's always been about challenging myself. And and Jay knows that whenever somebody tells me like, you can't do this or, or any of that type of stuff, I'm like, no, there's a solution and we're going to figure this out. And I love that Jay is so energetic because see, for me, I want to learn how to be better. My desire is continuously, how can I be better? And, And when I, even when I get up in the morning, it's like, okay, how can I have energy to do X, Y, Z? Or what is it that I can do today to just know more of my power? Because part of who we are is the questions that we ask ourselves. It's not like, why me? What am I going through? When am I, when am I going to catch a break? That's a bunch of BS. Those are like disempowering questions. You got to, first of all, get deep with yourself and say, okay, who am I willing to become? What am I willing to do to become that person? It becomes where you're, you're investing in you and knowing who you are. And as I've gotten to know who I am, like, I know what is possible for me. I know that I can train like a beast. I know that like when Jay and I are right right now, we're training for for Mexico and I want to rock a certain bikini. That could be a goal for me to rock that bikini because at 52, dude, I would never thought even in my forties that at 52, I'd be rocking a bikini. And it's like, that's pretty cool. Okay. I'll do that. And for the record, for everybody that watches this, Monica's contract does stipulate that she has to look good in the bikini until she's set. Anyway, continue. See, that kind of stuff, like, it's fun for me because it's just, a, it's a challenge. It's a continuous challenge of how can I be better than I was yesterday? It's not about me looking like the Instagram model that doesn't probably even look like that or like some famous person. I watch zero TV. I don't have any idea who celebrities are because I made a commitment to myself to focus in and on me. And I am not going to elevate somebody else because they're a celebrity and think, oh, wow, they're better than me. So they have all the answers. No, 
The only one who's going to have the answers for me is going within and knowing what works for me. And then, of course, I have Jay, who's, you know, a good advisor on what to do and what not to do. And sometimes he'll be like, dude, what the fuck? We've already talked about this. But I sometimes, in, in, in my defense, it's good to have those little reminders because you guys, like, it's not hard to be in shape when you make it a part of your life. It's part of who you are. It's like getting up and brushing your teeth. You don't go and brush your teeth and go, oh my God, I wish I didn't have to brush my teeth. Why do I have to brush my teeth? Why do I have to take a shower? Oh, I hate to take a shower. But people do that about working out. People do that about food. Food is fuel. Food is not entertainment. Food is not pleasure. Yeah, I get it. Some foods taste really good. But even before I met Jay, I was like, you know, I don't want to look at food as I have to eat this all the time because, oh my God, this tastes so good. I didn't want to have anything control me because as soon as I give that power, just like back in the day when I was drinking alcohol, and for me, that was a part of like me being confident. I don't want to have anything. I don't want anything external to hold my power. Because if I do, then that has more power than me. And then it doesn't make any sense for me. So if, if I can't eat X for like a week, oh, wait, I, I want to eat X for a week. What am I going to do now? Because the challenge makes it more fun for me. And I enjoy, like when Jay, it's so funny because Jay and I will go on vacation. He's like, all right, we're not going to train this week. We're just going to relax. All right. What do we do when we first get there? He finds a gym. <laughs> and we train the week. And some people would be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're, like some of my friends, our friends that would travel with us be like, why are you training? It's, you're supposed to be off this week. I'm like, it's fine. Like, that's good. We want to train our body. We're going to train our body, even if we're just doing cardio. But for me, it's been more of an internal conversation of knowing and exploring who I am. And I think too many women these days won't allow themselves to do that because they get stuck in the thoughts of their head. They get stuck in, stuck in the um, insecurity that, you know, they're not 30 anymore. And, you know, that this other girl looks better than them. And guess what? You know what? There's going to be people that look better than me. There's going to be people that are uh, more fit than I am. But, you know, I'm rocking what I got and I'm enjoying. There's myself. very few women your age that are as fit as you, but I, I, want, oh, you yeah. to, I want you to address though, um, because one of your talking points is being a mom yet having your own identity. Like there's, you can be both, you know, I'll give Evan's story, right? Like you're, so your oldest son. So when Monica and I were dating and Monica was competing and on fabulously fit over 40 and social media and, and, and you know, and, and Instagram and pictures and stuff. And people started to see what Monica looked like. They were like, Jesus Christ, this woman is a knockout, right? Like she's a tan, her body is, incredibly insane and for all of you guys that have seen your body you know that it still is but like no. it was hard for her son evan who was well he was a senior in high school at this point he literally said to monica one time and i'll repeat i'm paraphrasing but he said mom why can't you just be that mexican mom and cook me food like all my other friends yeah he said cook monica, food my friends and i just like my other friends mom. and monica came to me and told me that and she was just like she was kind of sad you know she was like i don't you know what what do i do but it's like it's really hard for women, especially who do look good and our moms to like not be put in the whole crabs in the bucket mentality of like, you know, you can't look like that because it's wrong. You know what I mean? Like it's this whole culture of like, what the hell's the matter with you? You should be a fat, you know, again, Mexican mom or housewife and you should just be cooking and not yeah, not looking like you do. And so it was kind of really weird for Monica. And I think you probably had some self doubt, maybe, and even had some questions, you know, because you're like, my kids, this is what my kids think of me. But I, I think there's a lot of women out there, Monica, that, you know, again, they don't all look like you, but there's plenty of women that do. There's women that still compete and are in good shape and are moms and stuff like that. But it's, it's important for you guys to shine your feminine energy and shine your feminine light and be exactly who you ultimately be. And believe me, you're giving more motivation and positive aspiration to women, younger women, who are doing what you're doing than the women that are the fat housewives cooking. Yeah. And that, to me, that was always very important. I wanted my kids to have an example of what it was. Because me growing up, one, I wasn't athletic. You know, I could trip over my own two feet. Uh, two, my parents were not fit. And I knew within my heart of hearts, I desired 
to be healthy. Uh, I didn't understand training as well, but when I started to actually work in and on me physically, I wanted, to, and I had kids young because I was 24 when I had my first, you know, in my family, in the Mexican family, they always say, hey, once you have kids, your body is over uh. more. It's all done. It goes straight to your hips. And I used to think to myself, like, who said? Like, why, that, why does that have to be for women? Why do women have to think that way? But it becomes this belief, you know, you, you, you get trained by your family. And especially if you're hanging out with your family all the time, they're going to teach you about health or about being unhealthy. And a lot of my family took on the belief that once you have kids, you become, you just, your body goes to shit. And so a lot of them are overweight. A lot of them have struggles with, um, with obesity. And I didn't ever, I didn't ever, does, I didn't ever, never kept that belief pattern in me. And, and because of that, I was always working out, even when I didn't understand what to do. And so my kids always had that as an example. And even though Evan, Evan struggled with that at the beginning, because he used to say like, my friend think you're hot and I'm tired of like, you know, telling him to stop looking at you. You're hot. And and but then what was funny is like as we've gotten older, now he shows the pictures of our competing days. That's how he shows people who his mom and you he's are. He's like, yeah, he's, but I mean, and, but deep down, again, kids are cultured by whatever you want to call it, the fourth density hyperdimensional control system to be shameful. I mean, we could get into this podcast and go much deeper about how from birth we're taught to not love and trust ourselves. Yeah. We're, we're taught taught to shame ourselves we're taught to not be proud of who we are as individual beings we're not we're, we're taught to not share our greatness our self-individuality our you know our individuated consciousness which is like hey man look at me like i'm ripped and not only am i ripped but i'm carrying this amazing personality and if you come up and ask me questions about how to look like this i'll be happy to share with you and not charge you a cent right but it's like people are shamed into believing that it's wrong and that you shouldn't do that. You know, what did your ex-husband used to say? Like, if you would dress in a bikini, what was the words he used to say? You were a sinner or what was it? Oh, no, he would say that I would make other men stumble. That would make other men stumble. I mean, yeah. imagine having a mentality like that. Yeah. But it is it is cool today to see, like, Alana, like, my kids are all in their 20s. And, you know, I have my daughter who plays soccer. Like, she lifts and she trains. And, and her, she actually truly enjoys it. And actually all my kids lift and train. So it's like, it's really cool to see them enjoy it, to see that it was a part of who their upbringing and who they are. And, and that to me is priceless because if I could have, if I could have programmed my, my kids in any way is for them to understand their value and their worth and to work in and on themselves, which the, the majority of them do. There's some of them, you know, they're still struggling, but I find value in witnessing my children enjoy their own journey and it's really cool to see them do so and uncover more of their own power and value and you know we'll see you know and, and Gabby and Alex are learning the same thing they're learning about working their bodies they're wor learning about understanding their own value and worth and as they get older it's going to be really cool to see how they evolve and witness their journey too yeah yeah and, and I mean I mean I mean that's the thing is like Everybody, there's no book on parenting, babe. I mean, you know that. And like, you know, I can feel guilty and not be a good father, but I know that I am a good father. And I know you're a good mother because I see our children and they're good kids. They don't do it. They're not, they're not promiscuous. They're not drinking alcohol or doing drugs. They're not staying out late at night. They're not getting in trouble with the law. Not to say that kids that have done that aren't okay, but I'm just saying that like my role, my understanding, and again, I know that it's flawed, but my understanding of parenting is leading by example. It's not getting in your face and yelling at your kids, getting in your kid's face and yelling at them, telling them they have to do a specific way. Now, as you told me recently, like it's more about attention and intention. And there has to be, you do have to sometimes be a guiding force. And look, I had a conversation with my brother, Sean, last night about this, which is just random that he called me after you and I talked, but it's much harder to parent today than it used to be because social media and screens cause so much friction in our lives and our children's lives. I mean, when you and I were growing up and people our age, and for the record, I'll be 53 in a month and Monica will be 53 at the end of this year. Uh, we didn't have screens. We didn't have the internet. We didn't even have TV. We went outside. Well, we had TV, but we weren't focused yeah, on- Yeah, but I mean, 
I, I, didn't have trees. A, I didn't have a TV until I was literally. I was climbing trees and we would play until the light. Like we went outside. We had, things, dark. we had things to create curiosity. Yeah. And these the kids things- today. That all these kids today is just have overwhelming dopamine surges. And yeah. so they have boredom and the fear of missing out and all this nonsense. And so it's a lot harder to get our kids to be intrinsically motivated. It's it's like I told you before we moved here to Florida. Like teenage years are mind fuck time. It's where we got to be smarter than, than the kids because the kids think that they know more than us, which, yeah, technology wise, they probably do. Yet in being a human being, no. So it's like yesterday having the conversation with the girls and, you know, it's, it's funny because when I first let them both know that I want to have a conversation with them and they're like, Oh, I don't want to have a talk. I know this could be bad. And I asked them, I said, okay, so tell me when you get into a relationship, do you want to have a productive relationship or do you want to have an unproductive relationship? And they're like, well, I want to have a good relationship. I want it to be productive. Okay. So guess what's part of that communication. So we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation and we're going to talk about what's working and what's not working. Because if, if we don't, things don't get better. And it's important for us to have a conversation, put things out on the table and create a game plan on how we're going to make things better. Because honestly, when you sweep things under the rug, they don't get better. They get worse. And and then they kind of understood a little bit more because, you know, like Alex is essentially 16 and she's getting interested in boys and at some point, she is going to be in a relationship. And it's like I said to her, you're not going to be in a relationship and not discuss things with your boyfriend because you don't want to talk about it because then your relationship isn't productive. Yeah. You're going to want to put things out on the table. And I think that helped too because they realized like, yeah, okay, let's talk about things. And it's not coming from a, you did this and you need to be better. It's more like, all right, how do you see this, it, this whole situation? In your mind, how, what's working and what's not working? And... That's the problem I think nowadays is parents aren't having productive conversations with their kids. They're assuming that their kids are getting the direction that they need, but they're not. Like I remember with Alana when, you know, she was with us before she was in college, you know, she would be telling me about girls that were sleeping with boys in high school, maybe junior year. So they're like 16, 17 years old. And I'd be like, well, you know, so what reason do you think she's doing that? And she's like, well, she's her dad's not around. I said, yeah. So do you think she's searching and looking for attention from another man or from a young man to, to give her something? She goes, yeah, because she doesn't have her dad. And I said, how do you think all the boys think about her because she's sleeping around? Oh, they think she's a slut. I said, that's kind of sad because, you know, she she's really a little girl yearning for attention. That's all she is. And she's like, yeah, I get it, mom. And And sometimes if she asked me to go somewhere, I would ask her, how do you feel about the environment? Do you trust the people that are going to be there? And sometimes she would say, you know, no, I don't. And I said, okay, then you make the decision. You can blame it on me. I said, no, you don't have to go. And it's important for them to understand their own intuitive knowing. And I don't think kids practice it these days. They have to understand, really look at the situation and go, wait, is this really a good spot for me, like a productive, you know, um, environment for me to be in? And if it's not, then being okay with saying no. No, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, hundred um, percent. It's not easy to bear. As you know, I was down yesterday thinking that I'm not doing a good job with the girls. You know, I get out of the hole pretty fast nowadays. I'm much more, I bet much better coping tools, a lot of which you help teach me, but it's not easy to compare today. It, it, it really isn't. There's so much ex- ex- exogenous pressure, again, created by the screens, created by social media, created by these false you know, again, holographic realities that these kids see um, that they then compare themselves to. Um, and, and again, as you know, and, and I don't want to be, be a dead horse, but social media enhances yeah. self-hatred. It, it enhances self-hatred and, and self-loathing. Of course. Because these kids compare themselves to holographic imagery, to fake, not real, you know, video edited of their faces. I mean, you and I laugh all the time when we see these people put pictures of themselves up with all of their imperfections, blemishes, and blemishes, you know, optioned out, you know, edited out. It's insane where we have gotten to in our culture. And again, you know, the dark side, the parasitic forces, whatever they may be, the fourth density consortium, they, they literally encourage this. They want people to hate themselves. They want people to search for 
and 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 long for external saviors. They right. don't want people to understand that everything that a person has or that they require is internal. Right. And so they don't give them the tools, Monica. I can tell you from experience when I was lost and I was drinking and partying, and I told you the story that I actually sent spirits, you know, celebrating when I made poor choices. Like I could sense yeah, that I cool. was being drawn into these situations and then literally beating myself up afterwards and thinking, who are you? Like, this is not who you came to be. And I had to truly desire to be better and to actually take action to be better. It's one thing to say, oh, God, I know it could be better. But then all you're doing is you're like mentally masturbating about what I could, maybe I should do this and maybe I should do that. Oh, no, no, I could do this. And no, take action every day towards something better for yourself. You came here. There's only one you. That's such a cool experience to be you in this lifetime. There's no one else. And you get to decide how you're going to evolve. You're, you get to decide how this life experience is going to be for you. You can struggle through it. Or you can and be empowered and learn how to be all you came here to be. And to me, I choose to be empowered and learn how I came here to be. Because I've been through the struggle. I don't really like it there. It's not that much fun. I like it here. This is fun. And I'm still evolving, which is even better because I know I still, I still have more in me. And that to me is more exciting. And, you know, we might have to cut this short because we got to go get I got to go get Alex. No, just last comment. I already texted her. She's fine. Uh so the last bullet point is getting older, enjoying the process. And I don't really like that comment because you're only as old as you feel. And when we use the words old or getting older, like obviously, you know, I use the word aging because I think that's a better, more picturesque understanding of getting older, right? But like we are no more or no less powerful than the words that we use. So instead of saying I'm getting older, you're just saying I'm aging better or I'm aging backward or I'm aging gracefully or whatever it is. What we, we speak into existence what we ultimately desire. And again, when people see you and me in public, they don't think we're as old as we are. I mean, as you, as you know, recently, somebody who knows both of us saw a picture of me and my family and they were like, wow, you're, 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 you're the youngest of all these people. And I'm like, no, I'm the oldest. And he was like, what? So it's like you can, you can, by living the life that obviously we espouse, insulin controlled living, cardiovascular and resistance training, supplementation, human growth hormone, peptides, hormonal optimization, sleep, quality sleep, biohacking gadgetry like red light and acoustic wave, you know, vibrogenics technology, uh, the Rasha, you know, all of these things that we use. I mean, all of these adjuvants slash interventions are just tools, They're not like savior devices, but they, when you use them in combination with all the other things that we do, which again is our foundation. Yeah. There's no reason that we have to get old. I mean, yes, we don't recover like we recovered when we were 25 to 30, but we still look and feel the exact same way. And if we take our shirts off or you wear a bikini. I actually feel better than I did in what's my mean, Like, But we don't physiologically look less than when we were those young ages. So again, we are living proof that anyone can age backwards or regress or again, gracefully, however you want to, you know, anti-age, whatever you want to call it and still look and feel your absolute best. And there's again, no reason that you and I can't look like this, babe, until we're in our eighties and maybe. Yeah, I agree. No, I agree. And, and I'm not, I, what I mean by that though, is more of like, because to me, no matter what, it's the meaning behind the words that you use. And to me, aging isn't anything negative. It's, it's more about like time is passing regardless. We're going to have this time pass. How do you enjoy the time that you're in regardless? Because too many people are like, oh, I'm getting older. And I, I was actually with people, I remember in my 30s, looking in my closet, looking at some of the clothes and going, oh, that's too sexy. I'll never be able to do that. And, and meanwhile, I should see some of my bikinis and my clothes that I have in my closet. Like most 20 or 30 year olds wouldn't wear it. <laughs> But that's what my mentality was back then. And now I'm like, you know, I'm going to rock what I can until I cannot. And right now I feel good about this. And, and a lot of it is more of a feeling for me because I'm more feeling based and I truly desire to enjoy this journey. And so as we're doing whatever it is that we're doing, even while I'm working out, I'm reminding myself that I'm enjoying that process. 
It's not about I'm there and I'm like, here. It's like, all right, I'm working my body. We got this going on. Yes, I'm so good. Okay, let's breathe. Oh, yes. And that's, I'm paying attention to what's going on in my thoughts. And I, I'm working on continually programming my own mind because I'm not going to allow anyone else out there to decide who I'm going to be. And that's where I think a lot of people get screwed up is they think, you know, they have the red light machine. They're going to get so much better. But meanwhile, while they're in the red light machine, they're going like, I feel like shit. I'm so tired. My work is so frustrating. I'm going to eat pizza. What are you out? Right. Yeah. And like they have all these thoughts going on in their head that are completely defeating. And so what are you doing? You're basically Xing out any results that you can have because your thoughts are going to direct your cells. They're going to direct your body on what to do. And if you're not having empowering thoughts, you're basically anything that you do, good luck. It's not going to necessarily work. So that to me is like been the most important thing for me. If I'm in the red light, I'll be listening to my cell instructions or I'll be listening to my affirmations or, and I sit there and sometimes I'm just programming my brain on the instructions of what I desire it to do as the day progresses. And, and that has been rewarding and productive for me because I'll have the energy that's required to go throughout the day to do the things that I desire to do and to be who I came here to be. And so whatever it is that anybody's going to do, work on understanding your own inner programming. And sometimes it's not necessarily being so hyper-focused on what your thoughts are, but just understanding where your thoughts are taking you. And, and you could even just pause and be like, wow, I can't believe I'm thinking like that. That is so crazy. Okay, so what kind of a thought could I have right now so I could feel better? All right. Oh, I can actually... I can breathe unassisted, okay. And you can actually shift what's going on in your environment just by pausing and changing your thoughts and making the decision to do something different. And that, that's the part of enjoying the journey. Monica Campbell, I love you. You gotta actually do something with that site. Anyway, <laughs> that's where you can find Monica and then you can also find her. She actually does have very profound social media posts just not many people engage with her, even though I think she does. Um, be a part of my awesome. journey. All right, babe, you need to go get our kit or one of our children. I love you. Great, great show. I love you, baby. Hold yeah. on. I have to sign off correctly. So for all, all right. the amazing men and women, aging or not, who watch the Jay Campbell podcast, support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast, like my lovely wife, Monica. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon. Peace.